we just come before you. We thank you for this glorious day. We thank you that you love us, Lord. Thank you that you take tender care toward us, that your loving kindness is ours in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I pray for the teaching of your word, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that, and, and we would not be foolish hearers, that we would be doers of your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're almost to the end of the book of Acts. Although there is really no end to the book of Acts, you know that, right? Chapter 28, when we get there in a couple weeks, you'll go, that didn't sound like the ending. It didn't say, and they lived happily ever after. You know why? Because your life is chapter 3,242. The book of Acts continues until his return. And we, we're living in great days. The Lord wants to do great things. And I want him to use me, and I want him to use you. So, And this is the key right here. So let's lift this up to the Lord. If you have your Bible or your app, Father, this is your word. We believe it. Holy Spirit, guide us in all truth. Teach us, reprove us, correct us, instruct us in righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to go through a, an entire chapter again today. There's no way to really break it up. So if you want to make your way in your Bibles to Acts chapter 24, and I'll read it and you can follow along. What we're going to see here today is that Paul is going to find himself in a familiar spot. And it's a spot that his, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, found himself in all the time as well. And that spot is having to defend himself before false accusations. I don't know if you've ever been falsely accused. It's not fun. And the prosecutor in this case is a hired gun. He is a real pro, skilled in the art of rhetoric. They engage in this war of words. Words are very important, aren't they? It was with words that our God created the heavens and the earth. Ex nihilo, he spoke them out of nothing and they came to be because he spoke them, the word. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus saying, I am the word of life, the logos. So today's passage is all about words. And it's going to be very practical for us and it might hit home. The Lord might read your mail, as it were, but we're okay with that. The Lord wants us to be like him. He doesn't want us to have smooth words. He doesn't want us to have loaded words because we can use those, right? We need to keep those loaded words holstered. We need to be careful of lying words. Our words ought to be always authentic, true words. And we also need to be careful and be aware of idle words. So let's get into it. Verse 1 of chapter 24. Now, after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusations, accusation, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lucius, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him, you yourself may ascertain all these things which we accuse him of. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. Verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. 
And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a good conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before this council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lucius, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or to visit him. After, and after, many, after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. He's in a jam once again, but he gets a chance to proclaim the gospel. In this section, we see there in verse 1, this man who comes with most likely the Sadducees, because the Sadducees were the ruling class at this time. There might have been some Pharisees mixed in there, but it was mainly the Sadducees, which makes the passage even a little bit more ironic because you remember it's sad, you see. They don't believe in the resurrection, right? But they bring with, with them this hired gun, Tertullus. And I'm going to try not to call him by my nickname that I came up with him because I figured it wasn't nice. But it just sounded like his name sounded like Turtle. Tertulli, turtle, like, so I was calling him Turtle Boy, but then I erased it out of my notes, and so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but Tertullus uses two tactics. He uses smooth words, and then he also uses loaded words, both of which should serve as a severe warning for us not to use those things. Do not use smooth words, and Lord, help me not to use loaded words. Now, let's talk about this. Who are some people, some maybe occupations, perhaps, of people who are known to be smooth talkers? Car salesmen, I heard car salesmen. Hopefully there's no car salesmen in here, and you're probably the good one. But man, they get that pen out, don't they? They get that Sharpie out. If I could, would you? If I could drop this 500, would you? No, I still won't. But they have lawyers, right? Just like this. Now, there are good lawyers out there, right? I don't know. I just, I have hope. But there probably is, right? They're not all evil. Sports agents, politicians are smooth talkers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Smooth talking. Now, here's this guy. Now, it says he's an orator. The word there is rhetor where we get our word rhetoric or rhetorician. And we'll talk about what that is. But basically what it means is he's, he's a lawyer. Okay? So Tertullus comes down. He's obviously Greek by his name. 
He may or may not be converted to Judaism. It's unknown. But they got this guy. It's, do you remember the O.J. Simpson trial? Some of you remember O.J.? And he had his dream team, not the basketball team with Michael Jordan and all those guys, not the Olympic squad there, but that dream team of lawyers, that poor girl, Marsha Clark, she had no chance. She's probably a great lawyer, but she just had no chance with those five guys. And then the, the poet of Munch, them, Johnny Cochran, right? Judge, if it don't fit, you got to acquit. <laughs> How do you fight that? They're smooth talkers. They're trained in the art of rhetorical speech. Now, Tertullus, his name actually means thrice or three times hardened, triple hardened. And he is a rhetorician. And, we're, and you see it, don't you? What is rhetoric? Rhetoric is the art of effective speaking and writing. One of the techniques of a rhetoric is, and I'm going to say this wrong, so if you know Latin, just cut me some slack. Capitatio benevolente die. I think that was pretty close. What it means is it's Latin for winning of goodwill. You remember Eddie Haskell? Yeah. Miss Cleaver, you're looking great today. What do you want, right? I, I had a boyhood friend, and if you ask my sister even to this day, who was one of the most syrupy, flattering people that I hung around with? And immediately she would say this boy's name, who I won't say his name, Bill Nimbus. Um <laughs> But he was, and it was so obvious. Like he would do that to my parents. Oh, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Fox. You know, like, what do you want? <laughs> but he's fully trained in rhetoric. Listen to what he says. Let's look again at the smooth operator. But let's give him some slack first, though. Verse 2, what does it say? And when he was called upon. Why are you even bringing that up? It's just transition words. What, what's the deal? He waited until he was called upon. Is that how argumentative dialogue is happening today on TikTok and such things? Not at all. Some, like, their form of arguing a point is, <laughs> They scream their head off. Oh, good point. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. Wow, I stand corrected. Like, there's, there's no conversation there, is there? But, you see, we have to cut this guy some slack because he honored the rule of law, didn't he? He waited till he was called upon. He didn't step in there, I demand to be heard. I demand to be heard right now. You need to listen to me, you know, and, and we see that in our world today, too. But then it gets syrupy quick. Seeing, and I didn't want to say this when we first read through it. I just wanted you to hear it without the attitude. But there it is certainly how he is saying it. Seeing that through you, we enjoy such great peace. I mean, that's flat out flattery, isn't it? An interesting point of history, Felix had not really promoted peace. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, Felix had secretly hired some bandits who would rob Jewish people, and then he would get a cut. That's the Felix who we're reading about. He is not creating peace. But Tertullus, he continues. And we have... Such prosperity, notice what he says, and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. I'm surprised he didn't throw some adjectives in there about his foresight. You're wonderful and astute and delicious. Is that true? Oh, what great and sweeping changes you have brought to us. Oh, most awesomeness, Felix. Anybody getting sick from this at all? I got some synonyms for you for flattery. 
wheedling, sucking up, inveigling, that's fun, cajoling, well, there's flattery, sweet talk, and of course there's a few others that I won't mention because they're, they're not, they won't fit through the Philippians filter. Because we're talking about words, so let's talk about the Philippians filter, shall we? We shall, because I have the microphone. <laughs> Verse 8 of Philippians 4. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, virtuous, whatever is praiseworthy, meditate on these things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's in the Bible. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You got a cussing problem? The cussing's not the problem. That's a symptom of your problem. There's something else going on in your heart. Because if you're cussing and getting angry at something, you're angry without cause, maybe. And maybe you're even angry with cause. But does the Lord see it that way? What's going on in your heart? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that's the filter. But he's not done with the flattery. Oh, we accept it in all places. Translation, dude, everyone everywhere knows that you, Felix, are the bomb diggity. You are awesome. Everybody loves you. And then he says this, most noble Felix. Maybe a customary address, right? When you're talking to the governor, you, you address him like you don't, you honor the office. Maybe he's just honoring the office. Except for the fact that we would be hard-pressed to call Felix noble. It's not accurate. History tells us that Felix used to be a slave. How did he obtain the position of governor as a slave? Well, he did it through intrigue. He did it through lies and deception. And the historians tell us that he lived a life of utter, utter excess. He was the prodigal son, lived his life in profligate living, couldn't get enough of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And you know what? It could be said that he had never abandoned or gotten over his mentality of slave mentality. He was a slave, but now he's not, but he's living as one. Do you know some Christians that are like that? You've been set free in Jesus Christ, but yet you live as though you're a slave. You live in bondage. You let the enemy keep you in bondage when he wants you to be free and set free. And so he keeps on with this line, not to be too tedious to you. You're already being tedious, right? Right? I beg you to hear by your courtesy, because another thing I want to tell you, you know, is you're so courteous. You're such a, what a gracious, noble Felix you are. You know what? The sad fact is that Felix, knowing his character, because we've seen his character, the historians have written down what his actual character was like. He probably was just soaking that in. Man, you're great. <laughs> right, I'm great. You better believe it. I'm a great guy. Just ask me. I'll tell you. I'm a great guy. Some of my favorite people are me, myself, and I. I'm hot. I'm on fire. Look at me. Check me out. Probably was eating that up. Man, danger, isn't there? But that's the intention of flattery. There is an intention, a motive behind most flattery. What is flattery? Well, biblical, or uh, just a dictionary definition, really. Excessive and insincere praise given in order to ingratiate oneself. Nice message, Pastor. Can I borrow 20 bucks? But men, be forewarned. Proverbs 6.24, do you know what it warns us of in there? It warns men against the smooth tongue and the flattery 
of the adulteress. Hey, big boy. I don't know if you've ever been in here when we lock up, but our alarm, we need to change it. She's a little too sultry. Please exit now. I, I need somebody like Sean Connery. Just get out. But we're warned. Flattery. The adulteress will flatter you. They'll tell you those nice things that, they, that you want to hear, and your flesh will eat it up, but your spirit ought to be rejecting it. Proverbs 7.21, With much seductive speech she persuades him, with her smooth talk she compels him. He almost goes on for two chapters, talking about the wiles and the flattery of the adulterous woman. Listen, flattery... And you can mark this down, is often the first step of an adulterous affair. Flattery keeps nice, cozy, warm company with lying. Flattery is also the weapon in the arsenal of all false teachers. You want to live your best life now? You need to live your best life. Are you living your best life now? Everything's rainbows and Unicorns, everybody. <laughs> you guys are amazing. You guys are just amazing. You're amazing. Look at how well-dressed you are. I'm not saying you should come into a group and just go, man, you guys are ugly, you know. <laughs> you kind of alienate your audience a little bit that way. Listen to what Romans 16, 18 says about false teachers. Do we have more of them now than we did earlier? Yes, we do. Listen. They do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own belly. The belly is the picture of desires. So the God of their stomach, I want, I want, and it's not just about food. And then what do they use? Smooth words and flattering speech to deceive the hearts of the simple. You and I are not to be simple. We should never be simple. We have the word of God in front of us. God doesn't want us to be simple. He wants us to live simple, right? We should lead quiet lives. But we should not be gomers and bumpkins and go, well, I didn't know she was going to flatter me. <laughs> June once, or Jude. I said June. That's not actually a Bible book. It's a month. I know, I know. Jude one sixteen, and they with their mouths, out of their mouths come great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Paul absolutely distances himself such, from such practice. First Thessalonians 2.5. Got to get that thing working. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetous. God is witness. And amen to that. God is witness to your speech. We'll reference it later. But Matthew, in Matthew, Jesus tells us, not one of our idle words will be forgotten. You will be held accountable for every single thing that comes out of your mouth. And it's either under the blood of Jesus Christ or it's not. So I say you get under the blood of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's done slathering that thick coat of flattery. He's got his audience. Now he's ready, and he's going to use loaded words. Here's what I mean by that. In my English classes, when I taught English, I would teach the students about the difference between denotation and connotation with words. Denotations, what does it mean? What does the dictionary say? Connotation, co, together, along with. What meaning comes along with that word? Those are loaded words. And they can have either negative or positive or even neutral baggage with it, but there's always extra meaning when it has connotation. I'm going to give you a little quiz. You ready? You guys ready? So which one of these has negative connotation? I'll give you three choices. Ready? And I'm not going to give you the answer ahead of time. Club. Group, click. Click. It has negative connotation, it doesn't. 
Some of the words that you use in your arguments with your wife and your husband or your children or your grandparents or whoever you're dealing with, a person at Dollar General. You're using loaded language and you're wondering why, oh why did that just explode like that? A gentle answer promotes peace, but a harsh answer stirs up anger. Our words matter. And if we're using loaded words, look what he says. We found this man to be a little bit of a, a nuisance, a little bit of trouble, temperamental. That's what we say with kids, you know, in, in the classroom. Oh, your child, well, he's, he's a little precocious. Tertullus, no, he says he's a plague. Paul is a plague. He's causing death everywhere he goes. You imagine saying that to the kids? Parent-teacher conference? Well, Johnny... He's basically a plague. There's no, no way to soften that. I'm sorry. He's a pestilence. You know, like the thing that Pharaoh had to deal with in Egypt because he wouldn't listen and he was trying to battle Almighty God and all those pestilences came. That's what they're calling Paul. That seems a little extra. He's a creator of dissension. He's the creator of dissension, like all of it? Among all the Jews and throughout all the world, you never, you always do that. You ever use those words? He's a ringleader. I didn't even know they had a circus back then, but I think that's our word. He's a front rank man, a chief or a champion. See, that's another aspect of rhetoric when we want to, that we want to steer clear from. Using loaded words. James says, you are to be quick to listen, you're slow to speak, and slow to anger. You have two of these and one of these pie holes, where you put the pie. That's where you put the pie. The ratio is evident. Speak less than you listen. Listen more than you speak. James goes on about the tongue, doesn't he? He calls it a restless evil. Practice this with me. Everybody go like this, like you're going to eat a piece of pie and then close it. Oh, that little vicious serpent in your mouth? God made a cage for it. <laughs> Zip it. <laughs> Zip it. A restless evil. It's a small member and yet... It causes extreme damage, doesn't it? Because once it comes out of the pie hole, you can't stuff it back in. James says, this tongue of ours, it's set on fire by hell. I think he's got our attention. He says, blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. And then he winds it up. And do you hear his heart? Because I, I think he was breaking when he was writing these words. My brothers, this should not be. We are to bless with this thing. Jesus even said, well, you don't know what they did to me. I do care what they did to you, but that is inconsequential because Jesus said, bless those who curse you. He did not say, curse those who curse you. Well, he cut me off in traffic, so I told him he's number one. Bless, guard yourself from smooth words, from flattery. Because the honest answer is you don't know what's going on in your heart behind those flattery. I know what it was when I was a high schooler, but we have to be careful how we're speaking to one another. If you say, hey, nice shirt, that could be misread by somebody, right? Especially if I say, ooh, that looks good on you. What did that mean, Pastor? Right. What did that mean? Because the heart above all else is deceitfully wicked and, and, and the word says, who can know it? Because behind the flattery, mm, probably lurking some dark motivation. So guard yourself from those things. But Tertullus, he's got a, he's got a full toolbox. He's got loaded words, but he's also got lying words. <coughs> lying words. Pick it up with me in verse 6. They tried, 
Paul tried to profane the temple. We've read the story. Is that true? No, he did not try to profane the temple. We seized him. Untrue as well. They didn't seize him. Turtle boy, I mean Tertullius, he, he wasn't even probably there. So what's this we stuff? You got a mouse in your pocket? Our law, he says. Tertullius? That has a Greek ring to it to me, right? Your, no, not our law, their law. And then Lucius, verse 7, with great violence. Is that how it happened? Is that how it went down? No, we, we read the story. That's not how it went down. He's lying. And he actually hasn't brought up anything that is a crime. Not in a Roman court. Verse 8. A wise thing that he says. Again, we don't want to beat up on Tertullius too much. But he says, you may ascertain. That means ascertain comes from two Greek words. We got dunamai or dunamis, dynamite. That's where we get our word dynamite, power, right? Holy Spirit is our dunamis power. And then dunamis, but then we have gnosko, knowledge that came by seeking or investigating. Do you want a judge that doesn't have dunamis gnosko? I don't, and he doesn't either. So he says, you may ascertain what, that's a fancy word, but if you actually just break it down into two words, it's a little bit more simple. You know as something that is certain. It is certain. And that's his closing argument. You see, judge, I have been just as Shakespeare once said of the idiot. My words are full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. He has said nothing. He's using lying words. He's using smooth words. He's trying to butter the guy up because he doesn't have a case. When somebody's flattering you, they probably likewise don't really have a case. You should already have your decision made. They're flattering you. Why are they flattering you? Why is the car salesman flattering you? Oh, you look good in that car, mister. Man, I bet you the, bet you the girls are going to be flocking to ride in that car with you. Is he being sincere there? Even if he is, <laughs> even if that were to happen, he's using flattery because he wants to sell the car. Verse 9, and you see the Jews. Didn't say a word. They just let the orator do his thing, do the flattery, go through the lies, and they're just gone. Yup, what he said, what that guy said. Smooth words, loaded words, lying words. Well, let's talk about lying words more because I think you want to. And I think God wants us to as well. Things can be a lie if they're an outright lie. If I told you, if, if I told George earlier that I, I, oh, I too likewise could bench 500 pounds, not a problem. But what I meant, see, you thought I meant at one time. That's not what I meant. I meant... 25 pounds, and then I do, do the, help me with the math, 30 reps. That's somewhere in the neighborhood. Outright lies, but then white lies. Call them little white lies. And I know my Bible. Listen, I know that there are examples where we have somebody like Abraham who lied to protect his wife. But I wouldn't call that the same kind of lie as a lie to get something that you want because your flesh wants it. But they can be white lies, lies mixed with the truth. Oh, how about sarcasm? Sarcasm comes from a French root, sacra, and it means to tear the flesh. Mark Twain mentioned about sarcasm is the problem with it is that within that sarcasm is a nugget of truth that the person is trying to say. Isn't that what's going on with sarcasm? You're trying to say something without being caught for saying something, but yet you're still saying it, and you got to say it, and you go away, and you're like, I said it, but they didn't know because I hid it in sarcasm. Oh, and this one, another form of lying, the sin of omission. There's a sin of commission. I committed it, and then there's a sin of omission. I should have told that person about the Lord. The sin of omission, not telling the truth, remaining silent. Oh, I can't be bothered with that. I saw the car accident, but I don't have time for that. 
the sin of omission. And here's the thing. What does God feel about? Because that's the most important thing. We, we could talk about language. We could talk about, you know, cussing. We can talk about how the more they say it, the less meaning it has. But the meaning of it isn't the problem because if, if I said microphone and now that's now a dirty word, it's a dirty word not because of the, the letters. It's a dirty word because of the context and the reason I'm saying it. Lying, God is not a fan of it. I don't know if you know that. It's in the ten biggies. It made the top ten, right there in Exodus 20. It made the top ten, but listen to what it says in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. See if you notice something repeated. These are seven things that God counts as detestable. He hates it. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Now, pay attention to all of them. We're talking about lying words, but all of these, I don't want them anywhere near me if God detests them. Haughty eyes. Haughty means proud, arrogant. Again, our former president might need to memorize Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. I'm a great guy, just ask me, I'll tell you. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue, there it is. God detests lying tongues. Should we lie? No, we shouldn't. God doesn't like it. Hands that shed innocent blood. Whew. That ought to shake the abortion doctors a little bit. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness. Wait a second. A false witness is a liar. So in this list of seven things that God detests, lying is in there twice. Wow. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Mm. I hope there's no pot stirrers in this church. And I don't think there is. But you see that happen a lot. Somebody comes in with an agenda and they just stir up trouble. God hates that. Here's what we rather should shoot for. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing, be acceptable to you or acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's our prayer. But the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And now here comes Paul's defense, verse 10. And I want you to notice first off, verse 10, Paul then, after the governor had not for him to speak, did Paul interrupt Tertullius's lies? Hey, he's lying about me. What are you, why are you leaving us? You know, like trying to shout over the other person. No. He understands the rule of law, and he waits his turn. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a message for us, isn't it? Wait your turn to speak. You'll be given your day in court. And he answered, And as much as I know that you have been here for many years as a judge of this nation, a judge didn't hang around in a Roman court too long if they were a wicked and terrible judge. And we don't want a wicked and terrible judge, and that's why Jesus tells us that we should not judge. But let me explain that. If you lie to me repeatedly and I call you a liar, I am not judging you. That is not judging. I am judging what's coming out of your pie hole. You keep lying to me, so I called you a liar. I called your action a lie, and, and you are lying, and you're a liar. But if I tell you why you're lying, now I'm in a realm I shouldn't be in. Now I'm guessing because I have no idea what's going on in your heart. I just know the fact that you lied to me. So I'm not judging if I call somebody a liar who lies, if somebody steals all the time and I call him a stealer or a thief. But Paul, notice, he's all by himself. No Tertullius, no Morgan and Morgan, the poor duffer. But he's respectful, but he's not gushing with praise. He said, I'm grateful that you're here so I could actually talk to a judge that is worth his salt. And he uses the same word, dunamai gnosko, that you may ascertain. He has faith that this man that is there has the power of discernment. 
that he could know. Any good judge would be able to do that, right? And do you know why God is such a great judge? Because he has all power and all knowledge. And so he is rightly the judge. We ought to let him do that, right? He's the judge. And in verse 12, neither nor. He's in temple disputing or inciting a riot. <laughs> they didn't do either one of those. Nor can they prove it. They're baseless accusations. They're not true. But then he says, this is true. This I confess to you. Confess comes from the Greek word homologeo. It means to say the same thing. God says lying is wrong. If you say, well, you know, lying is not that big a deal, you are not homo logeo. You are not saying the same thing because God says, I detest it. So he says, this thing I do confess, I follow Jesus Christ. And by following Jesus Christ, I follow the God of my fathers because of the God of my fathers, that's my Old Testament. The law and the prophets, that is the entire Old Testament he's speaking of. And Jesus said of himself, in the entire volume of the book, it is written of me. Go to Leviticus, Jesus is there. Go to Genesis, Jesus is there. Go to Hosea, Jesus is there. Go to Revelation, oh yeah, Jesus is there. This word of God. He says, I follow my father's. Because this entire book, this entire Old Testament was looking forward to a day when God would send his only son who would be the Messiah, the Savior. And now he's come. And so I haven't divorced myself from my heritage. I follow the God of my fathers. Those guys that reject Jesus Christ are not following the God of my fathers anymore. That I confess to you. I also confess this. I have a hope in God. Aren't you glad to have hope? Because our hope isn't like, I hope I get a Lamborghini someday. Probably not going to happen. But I have a hope in God. It's firm and it's real and it's tangible. We have such a hope, do we not? Such a hope in Christ. And then he says, which they accept. Did they accept it? Or is Paul just using some words there to like poke in there a little bit? The Pharisees do accept resurrection, but the Sadducees, they don't. Because later in that verse, verse 15, he says, a resurrection from the dead. That's what I believe in. I confess this to you, that I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Most on the dream team are Sadducees, so they didn't see it. But then Paul says something interesting that we need to discuss. It says that there is a resurrection of the just and the unjust. How do you become just? Because you are not just just. Before I came to Christ, I had a pile of sin, and so did you. A pile of sin. And it wasn't going anywhere, and I owned it, and I was going to pay the bill. And I was going to pay the bill by being separated from God for all eternity. It wasn't his fault. He wasn't sending me anywhere. I was choosing to continue to sin because we have a conscience. We talked about it last week, right? We have a conscience. We know. So to become just, I have to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to my life. And then he is the justifier of me. I am just before God. It's just as if I'd never sinned, justified. And so there's a resurrection of the just. I get that. When Jesus come back to get the church, if I don't pass away before that, because I'm justified. I'm with Christ. I, I, I bear him in my, my being. But what about the resurrection to the unjust? Is that such a thing? It's actually a very important thing that we understand, that there is a resurrection for the unjust and if they're unjust, they are not just before God. They have the pile of sin, and they are destined and bound for an eternity separated from God. And that's their resurrection. Not a fun resurrection, isn't it? Do you, do you prefer our resurrection? I prefer our resurrection. And we pray for those that are still unjust. They need to be justified. 
But I also want to point out a false teaching that's out there that's related to this. And it's called soul sleep. Soul sleep is a false teaching that teaches that the annihilation of the soul happens for the unrighteous. They die, but then they don't have to suffer. Their, their soul just gets kind of annihilated. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that those who are in Christ go to heaven. Those who are outside of Christ and don't have the forgiveness are going to hell. Paul says later, verse 16, I, I strive, we talked about it again last week a lot, I strive to have a conscience without offense. Isn't it awesome to have a clear conscience? And then there are times during the week where you get muddy, right? Like you come to church on Sunday and you're like, man, I had a great time. I, I gave some things to the Lord and I just I'm, my conscience is so clean. But then things happen. But aren't you glad also that when your conscience becomes even a bit dirty, you just come to the Lord and you say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry for my attitude. I'm sorry for the thoughts that are going through my brain. Lord, help me. To strive for a conscience without offense. What a great thing. Paul then talks about the alms that he was bringing. He talked about it in three different passages, Galatians, Romans, and 2 Corinthians, about bringing a collection from the different churches for the poor. And so he says, I was in the midst of that. I was, I was about to give the money over. I was doing the Lord's business, but I was purified in the temple. If he's purified in the temple, there's no offense. And yet they're saying he profaned the temple. And they came up with, you remember, his buddy, the Greek guy, happened to go in there. Not the case. He continues to defend himself. They ought to have been here. And that's right. We, we enjoy that right in our legal system, right? You are allowed to be in the presence of your accusers if they're accusing you of something. And he says, well, if they're not here, that's not good. They should be here because where are they, the ones you know, that were uh, accusing me of this? Verse 20, or let those who are here. Hey, you guys are that are here. You got anything to say? There was crickets. There was crickets, weren't there? Nothing. These guys that were there, the only one talking was Tertullus, the hired gun. But he says, unless it is for this one thing, that I believe in the resurrection. So Paul rests his defense, and he only uses authentic words. He speaks the truth. He's respectful. No flattery, no cajoling, no deception. This is the facts. Does that always mean that when you do that, a good result will happen? Not on this plane. No, sometimes you'll do that, and there is people who have spent a lot of time in jail when they didn't do anything. And the truth was even, the truth even came out. Sorry, we can't help you. But how about before the Lord? Every time I tell the truth, every time I stand on the truth, I'm in good company with the Lord. He is pleased by our truthfulness. And so we're going to look at what I call the deliberation. Felix heard those things. And notice it said, verse 22, having a more accurate knowledge of the way. What does that mean? He already had it? Or could it mean that he just received it? I think he just received it. Here's Paul, a Christian, and, and I hope you're going to get the connection to you because you have Christ in you and you're going to meet people and you're going to be falsely accused. And here is Paul behaving in such a contrary way to the way the world works. He's being polite even when he's accused. He's not interrupting. He's speaking the truth as he has always done, as far as we can tell. So he has a more accurate knowledge of the way by seeing Paul. So my question is this. Do people who know you, when they get to know you, have a more accurate knowledge of the way just by being around you? I hope the answer is yes, but if it's not, Lord, Lord can like, help you with that. Because you represent the way. You re represent Jesus Christ. He is the only hope for this world. He is who he said he was. 
But notice what Felix does. He's in this conversation with Paul of all people. You get in a conversation with Paul, you're not getting out of it. And you know he's explaining the gospel backwards and forwards to you. And you know he's being super clear. And sir, Lu- he says, ah, when Lucius comes down, then I will make a decision. Do you see how unwise that is? Listen. Let's say I just started to talk about pornography. And you could be a female in here, and the, the numbers are going even higher for females that they're getting involved with pornography. Pornography is everywhere. And like you're probably thinking to yourself, I wish you would stop saying the word pornography because um, I'm struggling with that, and I wish you would just stop talking about it because I know that porno- pornography is wrong. I know that it's, you know, it is adultery. Um, but could you please stop talking about pornography because you keep saying the word pornography. And Lucius coming down, I'll make a decision later. No, the conviction's there right now, you see. Because if, if you were being convicted by that, the time to make the decision is right now. And say, Lord, I want to have victory, and I am trying in my own strength to do that, but I need your strength. I need your forgiveness, but I need your strength every day for that issue. But he says, I'll make a decision later. What a killer that is. Man, if the gospel makes sense to you right now, right now is when you should give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't wait because something else will get in the way. The enemy is a master of distraction, isn't he? Look at all the distractions we have. If you hear his voice today, if you hear his voice, right? And notice that Felix gave him a whole bunch of liberty. That's interesting. He put him in jail, but it was like, jail but not jail? All his friends would come, hey, hang out. And then verse 24, we are introduced to his wife, Drusilla, who is a Jewish woman. Now, I had a question for myself. How did Felix get this wife? Well, he got her to leave her husband, who was the king of Amisa. His name was Aziz. She doesn't have a good family line, by the way, Drusilla. She was a daughter of Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I is the one who killed the Apostle James. Her great uncle is one who had John the Baptist beheaded at that little party they were throwing and put it on a platter. And her great-grandfather is the one who ordered the execution of all of the Hebrew babies. This is the woman. But they're hearing him. He kept investigating the way. He's conversing with Paul. And Paul's thinking, maybe they're going to get it. Maybe they're going to get it. In verse 25, he reasoned about And boy, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? You ever had the Holy Spirit read your mail? Maybe he did earlier when I kept mentioning that P word. You remember the P word that I kept mentioning? That many people struggle with, but they struggle in silence about it? Pornography that is so pervasive in our world? That is such a destruction of everything that is good and wholesome in marriage and in life? Notice what he brings up as topics. Okay, because he's having his mail read. Righteousness. Righteousness properly defined as how I treat you. The righteousness factor is this way. We receive righteousness from Christ, I get that, but my righteousness is how do I treat you? How does Felix treat his fellow man? He steals from the Jews, he does this, he carouses with women. He's not righteous at all. How about... So he's probably like, dude, stop talking. I don't want to hear anymore. Self-control. How is he on the self-control department? Did he like that part of the sermon? I don't think he liked that part of the sermon. And then judgment. And he's probably like, Paul, your words are hard. And it says that Felix was afraid. Wrong response. Wrong response. Convicted. And when I'm convicted, I run to God. But he says, go away for now until a convenient time. When's that convenient time going to happen, do you think? Never. Never. Meanwhile, as he had also hoped, that money would be given him by Paul. You see his heart. You see how the Holy Spirit's opening up his heart? That's why I love the word. It's so real, isn't it? it? It's just what it is. Peter's not painted as some, like, awesome guy. He's Mr. Foot and Mouth. Paul's not perfect. 
But therefore he sent for him more often. He kept talking to him. You see how I, I came up with idle words? Because there does get to be a point where you've spoken. You've spoken, and, and the, the person knows. Each person is responsible before God. I'm responsible before God to bring the message to you that Jesus died for your sins and that you need to repent and give your life to Christ. That's the message that you have for all your family and your friends and the people you meet in the store. But notice verse 27, But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanting to do the Jews a favor. Are you kidding me? You see how worldly-minded he is? That it's all about garnering favor and, and getting to the next step and reaching that next level? Instead of listening to the words of the preacher, he heard, but he wasn't a hearer. And he leaves Paul bound there. Can you imagine Paul? Do you think Paul is going to get upset? He might have had a period of getting upset. Are you serious? You're leaving me here for two plus years? But no. no. Paul knows the Lord. He's walked with the Lord. He knows the Lord has something else for him. It's okay. Matthew twelve thirty six. But I say to you that every idle word you may speak, that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. The greatest words that you can ever say is, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I give you my life to you. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Those are some of the greatest words. And you will give an account for those words on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. If you don't know the Lord, your words of rejection, your every idle word that you've ever spoken, the bad language, the, the language that is couched in some sort of decency, but it's actually naughty. You know what I'm talking about. Because a word doesn't always have to start with F and, and, and some other letters to be bad. Innuendos. God promises that his word will not return void. We can't give up sharing the gospel because some people, to them, it will be idle babblings. You'll be an idle babbler speaking idle words. They just don't make any sense. That's not your issue because his word will re not, re not return void. In the case of Felix, God's word, did it go out? Felix heard the word of God, but he rejected it. And it's those very same words that are going to be the nails in his coffin. Let us guard our speech, brothers and sisters. Do not use smooth words. Don't be a smooth talker. Keep those loaded words, especially in our relationships, keep those loaded words holstered. You never, you always, be careful of words like that. Don't lie. Don't mingle truth with lies. But rather use authentic words. Use true words. That's why I love memorizing scripture. This is true. I need to meditate on what is true. Because this is for certain. When we share the gospel, it is the truth. And when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, those words are the power unto salvation. And everyone who doesn't know Christ needs to hear those words. And you have them in your little jar of clay. Amen? Amen. Lord, I thank you for instructing us, correcting us, exhorting us. Thank you that you, you answer our prayer, Lord. We believe this word of God. And Lord, some of us have been corrected. Some of us have been exhorted. Others have just been taught. Wherever we're at, Lord, Lord, we, we know that this mouth of ours can be used so quickly for cursing. Please help us to only allow blessing to come forth from our mouths. Help us to be a blessing to this world, Lord. Help us to keep our cool and not to sink to low level. Lord, I just love you, and I thank you for each person here. I love them too. I love that they study your word. I love that they're growing in you, and I pray you bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.